So, uh, my name is James W. Jesso, I'm from Canada, and um, I have written two books that are both about the topics where I'm going to talk about today in the incredibly short time that I have to do so. They're over there, they're called The True Light of Darkness and Decomposing the Shadow. Quick plug before I start talking, which is that they're for sale and I'm independent, so your sales go directly to supporting me doing this thing. Think about it, book signing after. Now, <laughs> moving on. Uh, the way that I've come to what I'm going to offer you today is essentially from being young and confused and unskillful and getting myself uh, kind of fucked up a bit. I mean, as in I was going out and getting fucked up and having a good time until I wasn't having a good time and I thought maybe if I just took more that I would have a good time. But essentially, like to the long run, finding that I had found myself confused and bogged down and uh, ultimately very unhealthy. <laughs> Somehow I found myself deciding, oh, you know, maybe this, uh, this socially and personally dysfunctional behaviors and thought patterns that I currently have that I brought about from substance abuse and extremely reckless, irresponsible lifestyle could be solved with taking more drugs. <laughs> and at that time, that was maybe like actually a responsible decision in a way, uh, because what I felt as though I could do was move into this idea of them being medicines. Now, the idea of them being medicines, them, I mean by psychedelics, has evolved since then because the lexicon, the words that we use, really uh, set the tone to how we'll relate to those things. And if we call it medicine, as beautiful as that might be, then that means that we're treating a pathology which makes us sick, which makes us broken, which might be true in a way, but on another level of truth is actually the thing that's blocking us from being healthy in the first place. So medicine might be a bit problematic. Either way, I went in to use them as a medicine to uh, heal the situation that I was in. And 13 months later, 13 months of taking about four grams of mushroom, mushrooms, uh, mostly by myself, though I had a sitter in the beginning the first couple times, and I had a friend that I could call up for most of the time and be like, hey, I need to talk about this experience I just finished having, like uh, you know, a few hours after I was mostly back into the default reality. Uh, so after the 13 months of doing this, I had become a totally different person. Now that's, that's a longer story and it's gonna miss out on a lot of great content if I go into it. But the basic content is the four archetypes of psilocybin, which is a part of a model that I constructed out of basically saying, what is happening, why is it happening, why is this working, why wasn't it working beforehand. Basically a very curious mind that led me to investigating and in that investigation distilling or crystallizing concepts around what psilocybin mushrooms can do for us, which were um, kind of taking from all the different camps, taking from the psychotherapy camp, which I think is, you know, as much as I honor the, the movement right now, can be problematic because if we totally medicalize psychedelics, like I said before, you know, that's this idea that it's only used when you're broken. I think it could be actually very advantageous when we use it as just pioneers on the, on the frontier of inner space, or if we use it simply to open up into enjoyable boundary dissolution with others or with ourselves or with you know, divine, whatever that might mean to you. And I took from the, uh, like the subculture and the sort of like far out ideas, but not now so far out that they don't make any sense in the real world. So the ideas of intergalactic mushroom spores and, uh, and uh, you know, plant spirits and all of these things might be functional to certain people inside of certain social dynamics within certain mind states, but isn't functional for all people. And I felt like finding a, a model, building a model, crystallizing what I said here, the four archetypes, that applies to most people, especially most people who were, like myself, raised in the Western, semi-Western, for me, I'm from Canada, it's a highly Americanized culture, uh, which doesn't necessarily include plant spirits, uh, and it doesn't necessarily include, I think these far out, highly transpersonal ideas make it very difficult to carry something home. And so I was taking from several different camps uh, another camp that I took from and continue to take from is the harm reduction camp, which in the hyperbolized big media culture looks like drugs are bad and high. 
and uh, basically say that mushrooms are as dangerous as heroin, which is almost as dangerous as cannabis. Uh, <laughs> and keeping in mind that these substances can be dangerous, and if they're not actually like psychologically, physically dangerous, you know, you might put yourself into a physically uncomfortable place, you might do irresponsible things that hurt yourself, like falling out of a tree and dislocating your arm because you were high on mushrooms. Uh, or whether or not it's, um, you know, maybe you hurt yourself, or maybe it's a psychological trauma. A lot of people will have a bad trip and never touch mushrooms again, and they just say, oh, it's because it doesn't work for me anymore, but in the reality, there's a trauma there. And what's the trauma from? The trauma is from a intense exposure of an inner content, content that's inside of you that was too much, too soon, too fast, and then frightening, and then a loop, and then the loop of anxiety becomes an issue. So I think that we need to be careful when we're taking these psychedelics, I like to say allies, but we could also say drugs, tools, whatever works for you guys. And so I wanted to take from that camp as well, because I felt as though there was this awesome benefit that the mushrooms had helped me um, achieve in my own life that I wanted to share with others, and in sharing with others, I got a lot of positive feedback. But I also wanted to mitigate the potential harm, and one of the biggest potential harms is, well, ignorant use. And then in the subcategory of ignorant use is getting exposed to uncomfortable material, uncomfortable um, content, which is likely, well, no matter what is coming from within yourself, but in, rel in relationship with something else. It becomes overwhelming, and then we get these little traumas that I talked about. So the four archetypes of psilocybin, um, which is presented in a clinical, academic style in decomposing the shadow, uh, basically works to offer a, say, a linguistic topography, or a word map, or a conceptual map, or model, to help navigate the psilocybin experience towards a specific outcome. And by specific outcome, I, I guess I kind of mean general outcome, but general within a certain picture, which is essentially the resolution of past emotional trauma, an increased uh, knowledge or awareness of self, the cultivation of psycho-spiritual maturity, and um, just generally the betterment of your own life, and in that your relationships with others, which means the life, life of your community as a whole, which means the life of the planet as a whole. And uh, some of the key themes in there is, uh, well, uh, facing the uncomfortable aspects of yourself as a primary um, benefit for psilocybin. It's not, not necessarily just like, oh, how beautiful things can be, but also being able to really deeply feel all that stuff that whether we chose to or are knowledgeable of it, um, we have hidden from our entire lives and have been shown to hide from, to repress, to repress so deeply that we don't even know that we're in a constant state of stress that just feels normal, but will eventually degenerate our physiological and psychological condition as we age. And I believe that psilocybin can help us, like I said, resolve past emotional trauma, which is to say, in computery language, sort of defragment the trauma body and in that kind of reintegrate those fragmented emotional memories into a more holistic understanding of who you are, which allows you to walk with these traumas as though they are part of your power, rather than to walk away from them like you're dragging a heavy ass fucking duffel bag full of monsters. In doing this, in doing this process of bringing up what is, inside of you, whether it is inside of you from 25 years ago, or whether it is inside of you because you're sort of, you were bothered by something that happened in the morning and you haven't looked at, or something that's happened currently in your life. When you bring this up into yourself and you become clear, when you become clear on what you're feeling and you deepen your capacity to feel, and in doing so, so learn about who you are, your behaviors, your perspectives, your, your dreams, your potentials, how you relate to your dreams and potentials, how you relate to others, and then why you are who you are, which is your cultural influences and how your cultural influences um, modulated your parents and how your parents' influences, the way that they helped train your nervous system symbiotically when you're an infant, as well as your boundary setting, as well as your basic attachment styles, 
and how that has uh, emerged out of a sociocultural familial lineage in your parents as well as a genetic lineage uh, as to say like an epigenetic back, uh, epigenetic lineage which is how what your parents grandparents great grandparents great great grandparents did with their lives where they lived and where they ate or what they ate and how that influenced your genetic potentials now that's a lot of content short time uh, and when you're doing these things, when you're coming to learn who you are and why you are who you are, and then the last thing, who you could be if all of a sudden all the things that you didn't realize were holding you down were now holding you up, who you could be then. That process is what I refer to as psycho-spiritual maturation. It's a reference to Neil Goldsmith, uh, who is a clinical psychologist, but it's also sort of taken on its own life as I've applied it into my own research and experiences. Psychospiritual maturation is something we're all going through all the time, and it happens in the personal, which is inside of us, the interpersonal, which is the kind of space between us, which is, of course, relative to the self, to my personal journey, to your personal journey, and how they intermingle with each other, how we dance the dance of shadow projections, or maybe dance the dance of life and love, or whatever it might be. And also the transpersonal, which is our relationship to that which is essentially beyond our individuated sense of uh, I am James, individuated sense of meanness. This is where the psycho-spiritual maturation process unfolds. It's natural, it's developmental, it's in all of us all the time, and it's possible for us to sort of deepen this process, to catalyze it, to push it, to give it a bit more energy. Now, psychedelics, in particular psilocybin, I believe, can help do this, but when you turn up the gain, and you turn up the energy, you also increase the risk, sort of increase the static, it becomes very difficult sort of to take everything in. If things are really simple and really bland, it's really easy to take in bland, but as you increase the gain, it becomes more difficult. So just Developing spiritually, developing psychologically, developing in your maturity, as difficult as it is, uh, difficult enough just as a regular human doing your thing in the world, getting confronted with all your own behaviors and the behaviors of others in this, I guess, a dance of shadow projections and being seen and putting on the persona and not being seen and not wanting to be seen but deeply craving to be seen. It's hard enough just being a normal person. But then you add in psychedelics to this mix, it can get very confusing. I recently watched a talk at Sci-Fi from a man named Bernardo Castro, really like this guy, and he gave a metaphor which I think was really good when he was asked, you know, can you achieve, he's talking about non-dual states of consciousness generally, I mean, you've got to look into his work to really know, but he's talking about this generally, and someone says, can you achieve these things without psychedelics? And he says, well, of course you can, but psychedelics are just the most reliably effective way to potentiate it. And this is what I thought was interesting, he said, but then when you turn up the game, when you turn up the intensity, the noise to signal ratio, I know I'm getting a bit technical here with like the frequency stuff, but noise to signal ratio becomes sort of intense and it's difficult to differentiate and pick out what's happening. And so it can be difficult to maintain, uh, maintain an understanding of what you're going through. So jumping back, I believe that I had figured out in some way or another how to sort of stay inside a particular signal, in my experience, to occasion this type of psycho-spiritual uh, maturation potentiator experience, which uh, works with somewhere between not enough and too much in the dose range. And so what I offer in this model is to you a set of words, which are a, make a, uh, a tapestry of concepts, which later I believe, I hope, can work as a map to relating to your psychedelic experiences and hopefully your experiences in your everyday life um, more easily. Which isn't to say that the experience gets more comfortable, but it's a little bit more easier. If you, want, if you have a map, it makes a bit more sense than if you're just like, that tree looks the same as that tree and these trails look the same. And so let's get into this map. I mean, like obviously I've been sharing it with you now. This uh, this whole time. But this map is the four archetypes of psilocybin with these references to 
you know, the development of your nervous system and boundary setting and attachment styles and psychospiritual maturity as a foundation, we step into the experience itself. And in the experience, I believe that there are four fundamental experiential characteristics, at least within the bandwidth of experience that I'm talking about here today, which is this psycho-spiritual maturity model. And that is surrender, facing the shadow, uncovering the true self, and oneness. Now these four archetypes, which is to say these four patterns or experiential characteristics are not separate. In fact, they are uh, sort of dance and weave seamlessly in the experience itself, but it makes it a little bit easier if we separate it in discussion first, so that we can sort of like, we plot the points, it's kind of easier to identify the nuances and subtleties in between. So surrender. Surrender is this premise of just totally giving up the control of what's happening around you. Now this isn't always the best choice to apply in life. Like for example, it's usually a good idea not to totally surrender to the will of your vehicle on the highway. But when it comes to emotions coming up inside of you, the type of surrender that I'm talking about is a type of surrendering to what is, surrendering to the present experience, to the feelings, the physical sensations in your body. When I say feelings, I don't say, hey, what are you feeling? I'm feeling like I'm not in a good mood for today's conference and that this person did that and then this person did this and last week, those aren't feelings. You know, feeling is I'm feeling some fluttering in my stomach. I'm feeling some tightness in my chest. Maybe I'm feeling that tightness swelling up into my throat. I feel my throat very strong. I feel swelling in my eyes. I feel... I feel what I think is sadness, and it feels like I'm crying. It feels wet on my face. It feels, this is your feelings. And so to surrender to your feelings. Now there's a whole discussion there about appropriate boundary setting and uh, discernment and stuff that's for another talk. But the idea of surrender in regards to the four archetypes is that when you take psilocybin, we'll just talk about psilocybin specifically here, I believe that what you're exposed to, especially in this bandwidth of experience I'm talking about, is you. It's you. It's your emotional honesty. It's something arising inside of you. Now it's from a, some mysterious marriage of this living organism that's primary alkaloids and function seems to be to you know, trip out primates. But it's still your inner content. It's based on you. And so to surrender, in daily life or to surrender in a psilocybin experience is to just allow what is to be there and to be with it. I like to think of it like the highest level of control, which is constantly surrendering, constantly surrendering, constantly releasing control. Because it's kind of difficult, right? As soon as you let go a little bit, you grab onto something else. You know, like, no, 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 just let it happen. I'm surrendering, I'm surrendering, I'm surrendering, I'm surrendering, I'm surrendering. I'm attached to surrendering. Oh. So this is the concept, this, and this applies into our whole life, because at any given moment, something might come up. And of course, we need to be responsible with our feelings, we need to be responsible with our boundaries. We need to be responsible with other people's feelings and responsible in respecting their boundaries and discerning. But at the same time, if something's coming up, we... I think we really gain from not going and doing something else, getting on your phone, getting on this, getting on that, eating this, doing that, smoking this, whatever, but to just really be with it. And with psilocybin, you, you just don't really have any other choice if you've taken enough of it. So surrender is the first archetype. The second archetype is facing the shadow, which is a reference to Jung's concept of the shadow. So it's like the everything you chose not to chose or have had chosen for you to hide from that you don't look at the things you don't like about yourself including your conditioning patterns around how you relate to that material coming up and how you relate to that material coming up in others this is the aspects of ourselves that feel sadness loneliness it's the loneliness we've carried around our entire life. It's the abandonment we carried around our entire life when that time when we were one, when mommy didn't come, when we cried in the crib until 
enough time went by that we cried ourselves to sleep, that we're still carrying this around in our nervous system. It's this type of material that can come up, and it can come up in absolute full potential, and it can be extremely frightening before we know what it is, because it's just something that aspects of our psychology and physiology are saying no, 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 no. And then we surrender and all of a sudden it's this sadness, it's this loneliness, it's this guilt, inadequacy, worthlessness, helplessness, sense of being lost. These things come up and we face it, we surrender to it. And in that we have an opportunity to really be with feeling. And in being with feeling we can, again, a longer discussion, but we can defragment past emotional content into an understanding in, the, in the, the continuity of the present moment that we've come to terms with it. We can resolve unresolved, hidden emotional traumas inside of ourselves if we can learn to face the shadow, which is something that we can face in everyday life, especially in our relationships. I believe an intimate relationship, be it a lover, be it a family member, be it a close friend. These are containers, these are highly psychic containers, psychedelic containers of stuff just coming up left, right, and center. If you're really, truly vulnerable with another person, all that garbage that you didn't even know is there is all of a sudden getting thrown at them and you don't even know why and they're throwing it at you and you don't know why. This is also an opportunity to face the shadow. So again, fast talk. The third one, we face the shadow. We face and we've come to surrender to the darker aspects of ourselves. Of course, it could be positive, but I'm focusing on the dark parts right now. You can apply all of this to the positive emotions as well. I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with that aspect and this aspect. So we face the shadow. And just beyond that, the third archetype, uncovering the true self. Which is to say that we start to uncover what's really there. I mean, we face the shadow, which is to say we face the monsters of our minds, we face the giant ego guards that say, no, you don't feel this, we can't see this, remember that time that it hurt, we can't hurt again like this. We face those things, we feel those things, in that we learn this deep capacity we all have to be sad. That we have that sadness inside of us, that we have this loneliness inside of us, but we also have this courage inside of us which is to say that we've earned this courage, we've discovered it, we've seen that we have the capacity. The true self is not only the dark parts that we hold and where we've come from and why we are, who we are, who we are, but it's also our capacity to discover who we can be. This fuller self, the true self, which is to say I'm no longer being manipulated and contorted by old dysfunctional beliefs and strange ego patterns of defense to protect me from hurting all the while hurting others and myself in the process, we can see who that person really is. And possibly in doing so, we can step beyond the individual self. We can step beyond who I am as James Jesso, and all of a sudden these feelings, maybe this shadow that we're facing, that we've surrendered to, is all of a sudden not just my sadness, but the sadness of the entire world. Possibly I'm not just crying because I feel alone, but I understand that there are millions and millions of people, billions of people all feeling alone right now, and I'm feeling with them. I go beyond myself, and I step into the fourth archetype, which is oneness. Possibly it's this experiential oneness. I'm sure some of you, maybe just raise your hand if you felt when you were tripping psychedelics, say mushrooms specifically, that you were crying beyond yourself. You were there for beyond your own feelings. That you were there maybe doing work on the astral realm for all of humanity or something. I mean, it's a little bit more far out, but we can go beyond just ourselves. We have a sense of oneness with the person, maybe with ourselves, maybe with the persons we're with, maybe with persons we've never met, entire generations of people we've never met. Possibly beyond that, maybe we're one with the flower, with the trees, with all of nature, with the wind and the sun and the water. And maybe we step even beyond that and we're one with the whole planet. And not just with the planet, we are the planet. Maybe we're beyond the oneness of being the planet and we become oneness itself. Possibly I am that I am. There's no time. There's no thing in particular. There's just oneness and maybe that is something 
that we might experience, and I believe mushrooms can offer us, if only just a brief, brief opportunity to be there, an opportunity to be there. All of these things, all of these four archetypes, these potential processes, are lessons that we can carry forth into the rest of our lives if we have a be- an understanding of how to navigate the high gain experience of psilocybin, if we have this mitigation of harm and an understanding of what the true possible benefits might be in our relationship to, as I described, this ally for my growth and journey in this world, and I believe an ally for many of you as well. So I believe that hits about 25 minutes-ish. Um, I'm going to open up to any questions that anyone has. <laughs> you got a question over here? Yeah, just generally, um, do you think there could also be the danger that in psychologizing is of the content that arises within consciousness, we are sort of um, perpetuating an attachment to this illusory, permanent entity? So the question is about, and correct me if I misunderstood the question, the question is about whether or not having these um, psychologizing, is that the word that you said? But like basically building these models of psychology and going in and just being like, oh, it's got to fit inside of this container, uh, if that can be detrimental to, uh, to a fuller picture of what is within consciousness? I think absolutely, absolutely 100%. But at the same time, I think what is more problematic is having absolutely no model, or an erratic model, or erratic concepts. Uh, in boundlessness, there is no freedom, because freedom means that you're can you f- you're free. Yeah, you can move, you can go. In boundlessness, there's no relative anything. There's nothing to assess yourself from. If I understand the boundaries of this room, I'm free to do whatever. Yeah. But if I was just an empty space, then there's nothing there. So I believe that it's important to build uh, these models. Like This is something that um, I think his name was Luke said earlier. It's important to be building these models. I also think it's extremely important to recognize at some point you got to kick that shit in the trash and step into what's new whatever that is that's arising in the living experience. You know, it's like if I just walk around and expect everything to fit into this mold, then I'm not going to see everything that's on the outside. But I also believe that this particular model can be very helpful in the human life of just being present in this world with other humans within the normal baseline reality that is my me interacting with your me in our little dance that we're doing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it speaks to it definitely. I mean, it would raise more questions, but I don't want to take more questions. Great, yeah, I understand. I mean, thing is, is that I'm not up here telling you, like, this is it. I'm saying, here's something that really works within this, per- this specific uh, premise that I've unlocked, which is basically, for me, how to feel more free and courageous to be present with what is in my life, in my experience, and thus with others as well. You know, in the premise of, there's a dance form called contact improvisation. It's like you take care of yourself so fully and completely that in simply taking care of yourself, you're already taking care of another person. So if, for me, I'm offering this, hey, this seems to work really well to better my life and it's better the lives of a lot of other people and it's the potential in this little assignment experience, but it's just one aspect. I think we, like Kalindi E.E. and Julian Palmer, these are two other, say, luminaries in the field, say, like, take more. Take more, get huge amounts, go as far out, and then come back and tell us what you found. Like, this is also something, I mean, the model is just a boat. I mean, it can get you places. Some of us need to just swim in the water, though. Any other questions? Did you find a relation between uh, a yogic or mystic experience of samadhi or uh, Satori, uh, together with this field of unity that comes from as a fourth archetype. Uh, there is, a, in Buddhism, they have meditation on the object, so what the object and Aruba, without object. So one is like something that you might become, and the second one uh, is within the field of unity. Um, 
Yeah, so the, the, I guess the question is, like, I can't really recapitulate this question because it's a bit of a, a Buddhist vernacular and sort of concepts that I'm not super familiar like with. The result of meditation, <coughs> the end the result of meditation, it's called samadhi. Okay. And the field of unity, it's very close to that, as you described. Yeah, I, I could say that from this very small amount that you've offered me, I could say probably yes, but it sounds like that's, you need to go swim in that water to know for sure. Yeah. I, I know it's like kind of a shitty answer, but I'm not, I'm not a know-it-all man. So you got That sounds like a really good area of research, though. Uh, okay, we got another question over here. Um, can you say anything about uh, the um, your uh, the, the way of tackling uh, the this change of view of the world? So if you if you are proceeding with well with yourself, so to say, as you mentioned, then you see all the world around you. Well, Almost all the other is looking to a different direction. Say your 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 the way you look at the world has changed if you take uh, for example science of it. And in the way you kind of drop out of the the ordinary way of tackling with life, of handling life, handling things. Is that anything you can say about it? Yeah, so it seems like the the question uh, is sort of my thoughts on integrating a uh, change in perspective, especially when you kind of go in and then you come out and the whole world feels a bit different and you're no longer in sync with sort of the, some of the things happening around you. Does that feel right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's important for us to consider the differences between a change in perspective and a change in behavior because you might tri trip psychedelics and everything looks different. You go out and you just live the same life but everything feels different, and maybe now everything feels worse. You just live the same life, but you know that it's all this like weird oligarch oligarchy that's manipulating and harvesting humans for our labor so we can pillage the land and build more useless products to harvest more labor or some crap. I mean, like, then obviously life's not gonna get that much better if you now know this, but you just keep playing the game. So the change in behavior is that if, if something changes for you, and I can't speak to what it is for you, but it, it's really questioning, okay, so what does this mean now? How do I apply this in my life? And actually thinking about those things. And maybe it means spending time with different people. Maybe it means starting a meditative practice, which I think is seems uh, very popular amongst people who take psychedelics to eventually go down that path. Uh, and maybe it means getting involved in other communities. Maybe it means moving to somewhere else where people are more in line with what you're doing. I mean, there's there's... There's a question there is that if things change for you inside, how are you going to apply those changes in your behavior, which is ultimately up to you and, and is your responsibility? Um, I hope that answers your question or at least addresses it. Well, it addresses it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the question of integration is, I think it's, it's, a, it's one of the biggest areas of consideration now is like, how do I actually do some stuff with what I just got there? Like, how does I do I actually carry these things forth in my life? And there's a lot of suggestions there. I mean, like, I take notes, I journal, I meditate, I set reminders on my phone for simple things to go off at, at specific timelines that help me carry it in the long-term memory. And, like, there's different, uh, there's a whole range of different possibilities. I'll take uh, maybe well, one, one more question. Go ahead. Um, so you seem to focus uh, very strongly on, on psilocybin mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, I could very much relate to your talk from my experiences with LSD. So I wanted to ask if you, what, what's your relationship to other kinds of psychedelics? And um, maybe just in short, what's like the, the main differences and maybe the main reason why you focus on psilocybin and not on other things? Right, so the, the question comes from a qualitative observation about you being able to achieve a lot of what I'm talking about here with LSD compared to psilocybin. Question about why I chose psilocybin, if I can speak to some of the differences. Yeah, maybe you, uh, the differences and why you uh, wanted to focus on psilocybin that much. What makes it unique for you? Yeah, what makes it unique for you? That's yeah, okay, so this is a great question. Um, I don't think it's a timing appropriate or like for me to go on and like list the different things. Uh, but what really called me to psilocybin, I mean, I can describe to you some of the external conditions that led me to start exploring that. Um, but ultimately, I don't know. I was just, I was just called to that. And in, in that process, I've, I've developed a relationship with it that leads me to be doing what I'm doing now and helping a lot of other people and helping myself and yeah, like it's really forwarded my life. I have relationships to other things, other psychedelics that 
offer me different things and similar things because you've noticed a lot of this is a carryover into any anything even outside of the psychedelic realm. Um, so I don't I really know. I used to be able to give this like yeah, it was like this and like this and like this and this. But the reality is like I, I don't really know. It just kind of happened. Yeah, it just kind of happened. So I mean. Again, for all of you, I mean, Luke mentioned this earlier, it's about identifying personality. I see it. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm, selling, I'm selling books over here. Uh, okay, you can clap, it's cool.